everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Oklahoma's wheat harvest is well underway. Producers are making good progress thanks to good weather conditions. The same is also true for canola harvest. To get us up to speed, here's SUNUP's Dave Deacon and our Extension Cropping System Specialist, Dr. Josh Lofton. Combines are rolling across the state, and with that, some of the research combines. And Josh, you're out cutting canola today. Yep. What are you seeing in the canola fields? Good things, Dave. Real good things. Uh, I, I mean, it, it's been good across the board from our winter crops. Um, that 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 kind of escaped the freeze is is looking pretty good. Um, and we talked about a couple weeks ago that you know canola is one of those ones that uh, we we've seen out here in this field as we were cutting a lot of freeze damage. A lot of that main raceme, uh, you know, either had very minimal pods on it or or had quite a few damaged pods on it. However, the yields as we're pulling it out are are really good. Um, we're talking out here this field and some of our treatments, we're, we're looking in between 40, 50, 55 bushel canola, which is really good for us, um, especially the year that it's gone through. And a lot of that came from the branches. And I just gotta emphasize, it's still a really good crop. We start looking out here, we got moisture underneath it. We have a wheat plot just uh, over across the field here. It doesn't have any moisture under it. It's pretty dry. When we go in and plant double crop, we're, we'll probably plant this one tomorrow. Um, once we harvest that wheat, we're gonna need a rain. Uh, so, so there is still quite a few advantages of growing canola. Um, and then if you, if you go on and you look and talk to the folks that are still have canola in their rotation, they're still seeing that really big yield bump from wheat uh, following the canola. Their fields are cleaner. Everything kind of looks good. You said that, that you're harvesting today. You're probably going to start planting tomorrow, if not at some point uh, in the near future. How, how are the summer crops across Oklahoma going as far as planting those? It depends on what mile mark you're at. Uh, just like most of our summers, our storms are real spotty, especially this time of year, this late May, early June. Uh, folks that have kind of hit some moisture um, are still planting, uh, still getting that crop in the ground. When we travel a little bit east of Tulsa, they're just now starting to dry out and start get those crops in the ground. I've heard some folks putting their first soybean and seed in the ground east of Tulsa as of this week. So we're, we're really far behind there. We're in a good spot out west. I've seen a lot of corn in the ground, looks really good. Uh, some good sorghum, good forage sorghum, a lot of great beans, some cotton going in. So a lot of our summer crops are looking really good. Now I have got a call or two because we are starting to see corn roll up in the afternoons. It's 100 degrees. I think we say it every summer. Yeah. That's okay. If it's three o'clock in the afternoon, it's been 100 degrees since 10 a.m. It's going to do that corn, sorghum, what have you, or they're going to roll up. Soybeans are going to flop over and show you their underbelly. That's okay. Uh, it, it's, it's when that's happening at eight or nine o'clock in the morning with some humidity, that's a, that's a, that's a sign of some severe drought stress. It, it's amazing what, what a difference a year makes. I mean, a year ago, we were trying to harvest in rain and, and, and a lots of moisture seems like the year before we were doing that too. This year it's dried out, everything's good. Talk about how, how those, those wet cycles during harvest and planting have, have influenced this year's crop and then possibly the future crop. Yeah, and, and a lot of people had some fields fallow out, um, which is not a bad thing. Right. And, and so we're starting to see a lot of crops go into some fallow ground. Maybe they didn't want to put wheat in. And so it's been over a year since we've had the crop in the ground. That th Those have been able to go in really early, uh, really timely and in good, good sort of condition. But the same kind of issues we have when it's really wet happen actually when it's really dry as well. We're talking about really shallow root systems. Um, if the crop doesn't doesn't have uh, the, the moisture real early to get those really sh really deep roots, we're, we're gonna continue to have issues. Um, don't tell those guys out east, we're dry, we're getting too dry because they're dealing with the opposite issue. Once again, it's another year like last year for those folks where they're getting in late, dealing with some real soggy conditions on, on already some soggier ground. Ag by the mile marker in Oklahoma. That's how it always goes, man. Dr. Josh Lofton, cropping system specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Wes Lee with your weekly Mesonet weather report. After a fairly normal spring, at least temperature-wise, June arrived with a vengeance. 
Daily high temperatures statewide far exceeded the normal highs of between 86 and 88 degrees. This chart plots the normal high temperatures in the blue fill and the actual June temperatures for the entire state with a dark line. Except for the temporary one-day reprieve created by a cold front on Wednesday, late summertime-like temps have baked the state. Unfortunately, the heat is expected to continue into next week and even longer. Here is the National Weather Service forecast for June 15th through the 19th. The tan and red colors indicate a greater than normal chance of being above the long-term normal. Especially devastating is the heat expected for the drought-stricken panhandle. Things don't seem to improve much when you look out at the predictions for the following week. Tans and reds still cover the entire state. This heat, with no additional rainfall, is quickly depleting the soil moisture in western Oklahoma. This map is the percentage of plant available water down to the 16 inch depth. There is less than 20% available water in the majority of the root zone in the Panhandle and many western counties. Now here's Gary with a look at the limited rainfall since April. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well, the story this week is pretty simple. We have drought rapidly intensifying across the state of Oklahoma. Not only that, but it's rapidly spreading as well. Let's get right to the new drought monitor map and see what we have. As you can see, much of the northwestern corner of the state is now covered by at least some kind of drought, whether it's moderate to severe to extreme. We now have that extreme uh, spreading from Cimarron County out into western Texas County, but little dollops of that uh, extreme drought also in uh, the southeastern part of Texas County and also over in Blaine and Kingfisher counties. And then we have the uh, severe drought, uh, of course, covering most of Texas County and then parts of uh, Dewey County and more of uh, Kingfisher County. Um, but then we have the moderate drought filling in the rest of that area. Uh, so we do see an increase from last week and it's pretty significant. This is a flash drought situation, so we're really looking at this the last couple of months of rainfall where it's really started to intensify. And we look at the observed mesonet rainfall for the last 60 days, we can see that pretty clearly. Uh, an inch out in uh, Boy City in the Cimarron uh, County area, uh, but then look over in Blaine and Dewey counties, Kingfisher counties, 2.2 inches of rain, 2.6, 3.1. So those are areas, again, that are missing out on all the good rainfall um, and really that's the case for much of Northwest Oklahoma. Looking at the departure from normal rainfall map for that same time frame, the last 60 days, we see significant, significant deficits uh, over that area, especially in Blaine and Dewey counties, nearly six inches below normal in Kingfisher County, and then out in the Panhandle, much of Northwest Oklahoma from two to four inches below normal. But really much of the state for the last 60 days has not had a surplus of moisture, only over in uh, far eastern Oklahoma do we see a general pattern of above normal rainfall. Again, this is a flash drought. It's rapidly intensifying, so we're just going to have to hope for some rainfall. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. There's new trade data out. So, Daryl, what does the meat trade picture look like? Well, you know, in general, it looks fairly positive, although for beef, uh, you know, April exports were down slightly. We're up for the year a little bit. Uh, imports on beef were down slightly, and they are up a little bit for the year. Pork exports continue very, very strong, uh, and broiler exports were fairly strong uh, in the month of April as well, and, and for the year to date. When it comes to the, you know, the, the protein trade picture, are there any bright spots there? Well, there are. I mean, you know, it, it varies by country, and so, um, you know, for beef uh, in particular, uh, Japan continues very strong. We have a new trade agreement that took effect on January 1, and we're really seeing the benefits of that now with a, with a more competitive tariff situation. Um, you know, and then China, of course, is a major driver, continues to be in the protein market. So pork exports were huge to China. Uh, in April for the year to date, that is expected to continue. Uh, China is buying additional protein as well. They're buying uh, broilers, 
Uh, in fact, broiler, uh, China is our second largest broiler export market now. A year ago, they didn't even buy any uh, broiler meat from us at this time. So, uh, so that's a, a fast growing market. And even for beef, um, you know, China uh, exports for the month of April were up 95%, but that's on a very small total. So, um, you know, they're, they're only about 1% of our exports, but it is growing and it's expected to continue growing. You know, sticking with the, um, the, the, pic, the trade picture outside of the U.S., are there any concerns at all in the international markets? Well, obviously, COVID's had a lot of impacts around the globe. So in general, there's some uncertainty about exactly how those impacts will play out. Um, Mexico for, for the U.S., I think Mexico is a particular concern. Mexico has got a very serious economic recession happening right now. Uh, they were already kind of having difficulties anyway. Plus, uh, they, they tend to be so tied to the U.S., our recession is going to spill over down there. Um, and so, and then COVID impacts directly. So uh, Mexico is a big concern of mine. Our beef exports to Mexico in the month of April were down 61%, we're down 22% uh, for the year. And so, and they're a major market for us. So that, that's one concern. South Korea slowed down a little bit in the month of April as far as beef exports. They've been one of our fastest growing markets for several years. So we have to watch that. I don't know that there's any major problems there, but we do have to keep an eye on it. Um, you know, going forward into the next, in, you know, for the rest of the year, what does the trade picture look like? Um, and are there anything that you could see that could disrupt or maybe even improve? Well, we, we really expect that trade is going to be one of the kind of bright spots for protein markets. Again, China is going to continue to be a big driver of all of the proteins in general. Uh, we have modified our expectations somewhat as a result of COVID-19 impacts around the world. Um, and there's certainly some uncertainty going forward, but you know, as we start to get into more recovery mode in the U.S. and dealing with our own recession here, I think the trade picture is probably going to be one of the brighter spots that we can look to to help us uh, uh, make some progress in the second half of the year. All righty, Daryl. Dr. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Those of us in the Southern Plains have some advantages over our friends that raise cows in the Northern Plains, and that is that we have some choices in terms of calving seasons, when we breed the cows and when we calve the cows. You see here in the Southern Plains, we have the capability of breeding uh, as we are right now during the springtime to have calves come anywhere from late January through March. or we can choose a fall calving herd where the breeding season might start in uh, very late November, go through December and part of January, and that gives us calves that come in September and October. The other option that we have, that certainly I don't think most in the Northern Plains have, and that is to choose both calving seasons, dividing the herd in half, having both a spring and a fall calving operation. There are some pros and cons to having two calving seasons versus one. Some of the advantages come in terms of reduced bull costs. You see, we can use the same bulls twice and therefore need half as many bulls as we would as if we were breeding all the cows in the same breeding season. For instance, if we have an 80 cow herd and we're going to uh, put out two bulls with 40 cows, and we can use the same two bulls in the spring calving season and the fall, uh, fall breeding season and therefore use half as many bulls and re reduce that cost considerably. We still, of course, must take really good care of those bulls in between those breeding seasons so that they're ready every six months instead of those that hey, can have a good part of the year off and can lose some condition and then we can regain it if we're just using them one time of the year. The other thought that uh, goes through our mind in terms of having two calving seasons instead of one is spreading out the marketing of the calves. And that means that we might be able to sell calves at two different times of the year to avoid any uh, uh, ups and downs volatility in the cattle market, which certainly we're well too well acquainted with here of recently. Now, if we take advantage of that, I think we also want to remember that we need to have that minimum of about 80 cows for our herd so that we can put together a package of calves both in the fall and in the spring when we market them of at least about 20 calves so that we have 20 calves that can go to the market at the same time 
They're the same weight, they're same sex, they've been uh, treated the same in terms of health requirements. All of those are identical. Buyers like to put together packages of calves rather than buying them just a few at a time. Disadvantages, of course, come from the fact that we have to have extra pastures in order to keep those cattle uh, separated by their uh, part in the production year that they're in. We also, of course, uh, must consider the labor requirements. We've got two calving seasons when we have to be out there watching heifers and cows to make sure that they get the assistance that they need. For fall calving situations, that often conflicts with wheat planting. It's hard to be two places at once if you're needing to get the wheat planted and watch those heifers that uh, need some uh, assistance at calving time. So those are some pros and cons to having two calving seasons versus one. It's not gonna be one size fits all. Give that some thought before you make some changes in your herd, but I thought it would be worth your time to think through the options that we have here in the Southern Plains. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SunUp's Cow-Calf Corner. There are a lot of moving parts when it comes to wheat harvest, and most of them are right here on the combine. Dr. John Long, our agricultural engineer, says it's important to keep an eye on your combine to prevent fires in your fields. I would say that probably 75% of the fires start in the engine area, around the exhaust system. A lot of times it's due to uh, you know, improper maintenance or a lot of uh, material buildup. Uh, you know, a lot of times when we're trying to um, harvest, we're really pushing the envelope. We have some really short windows, so we put a lot of stress on our, our engine systems. If you look at any combine, there's going to be tons of different types of pulleys, bearings, shafts, lots of things are going on in the combine itself. Um, so being able to maintain those, those belt systems, when we get our belts get worn, they tend to slip. Slip creates friction, which creates heat. Uh, bearings, uh, when bearings aren't lubricated properly, and even if they are, over time they'll wear out and eventually the seals will uh, rupture and we're going to have issues with uh, dry bearings. Dry bearings means heat and we can have bearings that get red hot and that's going to cause issue with that. A good way to uh, check for your bearings is to use a uh, little infrared thermometer. It makes a really good way to kind of get the combine out of the shed, uh, you know, run it up for the season, let it run for a little bit, and then you can go through and, and check all the points for uh, different temperatures very quickly. Uh, it's very difficult to tell whether that bearing's hot unless it's red hot to the touch, but it doesn't have to get that hot to, to uh, cause some fire issues. Uh, you know, in the day, clean things off, making sure that uh, uh, we don't have a lot of material there packed around things. Um, and then, you know, looking at eliminating the hot spots and areas where we could have issues with uh, heat. So. When the fire is going on the combine and it moves to the ground, what are some of the things that, that, that we need to be thinking about? I guess probably a lot of things we, we, we need to be thinking about possibly before that would ever even happen. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, we've, we've heard about fire extinguishers for sure, and, I, and, I, you, and you can't have enough of those fire, fire extinguishers. And I would equip not only your combine, but I'd have it in your tractor, I'd have it in your service vehicles, in your other vehicles that you're having on harvest and, and working with that. I think another thing that would, would help a lot to be prepared for is already have your local volunteer for a rural fire department phone number plugged into your phone. If, if the fire leaves, the piece of machinery gets on the ground, especially in, in wheat, it's going to burn quickly. It's going to burn with a, with a high intensity and it's going to burn rapidly. So it's going to move very quickly. So one of the main things is never get in front of that fire. Think about just a little bit of logistics about what, how's the wind blowing, where we need to park stuff so in case a fire does come, you know, it, it's blowing away from all of our equipment. In this time of year, June, July, the wind's moving pretty pretty quick, so it's it's going to move that fire quick. It's going to move that fire very quickly. You're not going to be able to outrun it. Again, like I said, it's just like a dormant grass fire. Mm -hmm. it's, going to, it's going to be able to go faster than you can go. And so that would be the next thing that I would mention to people, that if you are in a vehicle, combine, tractor, service vehicle, truck, whatever, and, a, and the fire is coming towards you, 
and the vehicle becomes incapacitated, you get stuck, it quits running, does whatever, stay in that vehicle. That's a scary thought to think about, and a lot of times it goes against what, we're, what we think, but that is the safest place to be if you're gonna get overtaken by that fire. Stay in those vehicles with the windows up, the fire will go by. You know, granted, you might burn some wiring up, it might blow the tires out. It's not, you know, it's not Hollywood. It's not going to blow the gas tank. The vehicle's not going to blow up, things like that. And then you can safely get out, but you will never outrun that fire. The, the most unsafe place you can be is outside that vehicle if, if it's not on fire, but you can't move it and, it's, and the fire's coming towards you. Combines are rolling across the state and the grain is coming into the bins. Kim, what are you hearing? I'm hearing that the test weight is really good. Uh, they're talking about an average test weight of 61 pounds, maybe a little bit higher, but I also understand that protein is lacking in some areas. The reports indicate that we've had wheat come in anywhere from 8% protein to 15% protein. And if you look at the protein premiums in uh, Kansas City and say 11% being the, the benchmark, below 11 has an 18 cent discount. Uh, at 11.8, you've got a 10 cent premium at 12% protein, 15% premium. At 12.2 to 12.8 to, uh, 12 is a 25% premium, and anything above uh, 13 and above is a 45 cent premium. So there's some good premiums out there for that high protein wheat. Looks like Oklahoma is going to average about 11.6. 11, uh, 11 and you know, there's, that's just an even even trade there. How, how are things looking internationally? Well, if you look around the world, <laughs> there's just a lot of uncertainty. Now, you gotta realize that as of June 1, about 25% of the world's 2020 uh, wheat has been harvested. Uh, you've got uh, India, probably got a, a record harvest, but that's crops come in relatively good. Uh, the United States, uh, we're projected to be a little bit less than last year. I think our wheat com is coming in probably about as expected, uh, low in the southern uh, part of Oklahoma. Uh, about even to slightly higher in northern. But you look at Russia, I've got estimates this last week in Russia from anywhere from 2.8 billion to 3 billion bushels. If you look at Australia, you know, we know that they're having a bigger crop. I read one report there that they've got expecting 44% higher production than last year. Russia, they're gonna start harvesting in some areas, but I think the good news there is that uh, they're looking at a, a decline in production in the uh, Stavropol area, that's close to the export area. Uh, they're talking about it being down 40%. That means that it's gonna, transportation's gonna be higher to get some of that wheat down to export. And every penny on that we can, uh, they can have to go higher, that's a penny that we can, can concentrate on there. So a lot of uncertainty, but it looks like we're gonna have a, a record or near record 28 billion a uh, plus bushel crop in the world this year and that our ending stocks or our stock wheat stocks will increase this year. You've been famous throughout the years with your third, a third, and a third uh, as far as marketing your wheat. Do you still hang tight to that? Well, my uh, third and a third and a third was sell a third at harvest, sell a third in September, October, and the final third, November, Deece. Right. I don't, you know, if you look at the, the last 12 years, 10 out of those 12 years, you needed your, your wheat sold by August 30, and in another one of those, you had to have it uh, sold by September 30. So only one out of 12 years did you keep it past uh, the end of September. So my third and the third, I still like that. But I'd say a third in June, a third in July, and a third in August. Staggered out over those months because you don't know which one of those months are, the price is going to peak. But the odds are better than 90% it's going to peak in one of those months. What are you seeing as far as the summer crop prices? Well, if you look at the summer crops and the, the plantings and stuff, if you look at corn around the United States, you've got 98% uh, of it planted right now. Uh, the condition of it's about 75% good to excellent compared to 59% last year. You look at soybeans, 90% planted, 72% good to e excellent. Cotton, you've got 80% of it uh, in the United States planted, 43% good to excellent compared to 44% last year. So the and the cotton price about where it was. You're looking at about 57 cents uh, uh, price in Oklahoma now. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And I wanna sneak in real quick, happy 10th anniversary to my beautiful wife, Crystal. 
With more people staying close to home the past couple of months, there is more interest in raising backyard chickens. Today, Northwest Area Livestock Specialist Dana Zook gets us up to speed. In this kind of climate we have, more people are staying home, they're uh, spending more time with their families, and so we've seen a, a increased popularity with backyard chicken ownership, and so there's been a lot of interest in um, getting chicks, starting some backyard laying hens, and that sort of thing. Chickens can be a great agricultural opportunity for families in both rural and urban areas. But there's more to it than traveling down to the local feed store and picking up a few chicks. There's a lot to consider. Before you bring home your chicks, are you allowed in your area to have chickens? So your city, county, and even neighborhood ordinances is very important to review because they may allow you to have chickens, but it may be that they limit you on the number of chickens, the size and the type. And most likely if you're in an urban area, you won't be able to have roosters or you know, any sort of poultry that's kind of loud. So in general, if we're talking about a smaller operation, so a backyard sort of situation, if you're in a semi-urban area, you need about one and a half square feet per bird, all right? Um, so if you have about five, four to five birds, it's a very small coop, but make sure that you're providing them with the adequate space. And then if they have a run, you need about five square feet in the run or the fenced in area um, if, they're, if they're enclosed. Now a free range, that may not be um, something that you're much concerned with. You can buy a coop or make one yourself. If you're starting with chicks, you'll also need a brooder. A brooder is a heated house that chicks need because they can't regulate their own temperature. Chickens can be a really exciting thing to have for your family, um, but it's important to understand the, the, the responsibility you have to take care of your chickens, make sure that they have a healthy environment, we maintain their health, um, but also that you understand that um, the health of your family. So with any livestock, you need to, handling livestock, it's important to uh, wash your hands in between. Another important thing in raising chickens is protecting them from predators even in urban areas. Predators are something, even in an urban situation, you really need to be concerned about um, because the neighborhood cat, your neighbor's dog, can really be a predator for your birds um, if they're not protected in their housing sort of enclosure. And so think about the house that they're in, the coop that they're in. Are there places that little animals can get in? I mean, raccoons and skunks and possums can really get into small spaces. And so make sure that, you know, things are enclosed. You want the poultry house to be well ventilated. Um, yeah, you can get coyotes, uh, hawks, owls can be a, a predator, a potential predator for poultry. And once it kind of gets started, predation gets started, they know that those chickens are there and so it can be a, a problem that you deal with in the future. For more information on backyard chickens, go to sunup.okstate.edu. I'm Curtis Hare. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.